We begin. So I just read the poem. John Crow's countenance would have been worthy of the stage as it changed from nervous boredom to startled surprise and from surprise to imaginative arrest and from imaginative arrest to a rush of excited resolution. But it was characteristic of him to just jump at once without any intervening steps to the main issue. Come on, Mr. Agerling, come on, sir, he cried, rising to his feet and clutching at the poet's modest bill, which was inscribed on a slip of paper with the words Othery's Dairy printed on the top of it. He rushed over to the young lady. Unfortunately for this impulsive motion of premature hospitality, John's pockets contained no more than a penny's halfpenny, whereas Hathington's debt to the shop was fourth pence. But the farmer poet produced sixpence, and ignoring, ignorant of the fact that he was tipping the daughter of the house, he left the change, in addition to John's penny halfpenny, upon the counter. Have you time to come to the mayor's house, said John eagerly. It's quite close. I was going to watch the boys playing rounders on Whirl Hill for a bit, and then go back to the office. But I know Mr. Jared will jump if you jump at your help if he hears that poem. It's exactly the sort of thing he we'd want. It's almost as if you were thinking of us when you wrote it. You must come to our first rehearsals. Those Dublin people won't be able to come till we've got pretty far advanced, and there are, I don't know quite how to put it, several ways of taking the Grail cult, which, which uh, the mayor and I don't want to appear at all. There are a few things, too, that I am very keen to get put in. And if you never had any card sharper, never had any pickpocket, never had any scallywag of a circus camp follower, leered as craftily as John did then into the open continents of Edward Alling. The young man himself was struck by the look, and he had penetration enough to detect the fact that this success of exaggerated cunning was really as transparent as the lying of a child. I feel, Alling said to John, as they approached Cardiff Villa, as if I were the player king being taught by sprinkling of minching melecho. Don't know what that means. Minching melecho. Hmm. This pageant, said John, with a quick sidelong glance to see how the youth would take it, is going to upset a great many people. Of course, said Alling, any original work of art is upsetting to the mob. John held the piece at this point. It was not his custom to weigh a person's character by anything that he said, least of all by any of those rather sententious remarks that Mr. Etling seemed to have a tendency to utter. John had his own secret and peculiar method of sounding a stranger's intellectual and emotional nature. It was a kind of etheric, psychic embrace, but not necessarily of an amorous character. The truth is that for not... Uh, for John, the soul of every person he met was something that he was doomed to explore. His own soul was like a vaporous serpent, and it rushed forth from the envelope of his body and wound itself around the other, licking this other's eye sockets with its forked tongue, peering into its heart, and into its brain, and pressing a cold snake head against its feverish nerves. The result of the coiling of John's soul around the soul of Alling as he walked by his side along the hot, dusty path towards Cardiff Villa, was that he realized that nothing could conceivably ever make Adling understand the mystical ecstasy of destruction and the deep metaphysical malice with which he longed to undermine the Grail legend. The whole tone of that lad, when he said that original art was upsetting to the mob, was distasteful to John. John's instincts were profoundly anti-aesthetic. When he enjoyed any, every, anything, it was by direct contact, as, as if the thing were a physical sensation, in the laws, principles, rules, methods, purposes, intentions, and above all, the opinions that led us to this special thing, seemed to him nothing but an exhausting and tedious pedantry, devoid of all value. They came now to Cardiff Villa, and John, opening the iron gate with a click, led Edward Alling up the little path between the pivot, uh, private privet bushes to the frontal entrance. Sally Jones, who had been watching their approach through the kitchen door, which opened straight upon the street, 
I hurried through the hallway in a fever of excitement to let them in. She too, like Pat Othery, knew Ned Elling as a local celebrity, and like all the Glastonbury girls who had thrilled by the rumors connecting him with Lady Rachel Zoyland, the daughter of the Marquis of P. Oh. Interesting. The master of Cardifilla gave his visitors a very cordial welcome when he found them in his dining room, and John lost no time in making his captured poet recite the lines about Merlin. The mayor listened with his big head sunk on his chest and his eyes closed. But when Alling had finished, it was clear that something in the verses had touched a kindred chord in him, for he clapped his plump hands together and uttered several times a sound which it is impossible to represent in print otherwise than by the syllables <laughs> This sound was eminently satisfactory to John, and apparently not lost to the author, for the latter plunged at once into an impassioned description, as if that he would do it that gave him a free hand with the libretto. One of the most practical results that followed from this introduction of young Atling to Mr. Geard, and John was not one to suffer from jealousy, was the fact that a few days later the whole place was placarded with posters announcing a public meeting in the Abbot's Tribunal to discover and to consider a new scheme for increasing the prestige of our ancient town. This public meeting was announced for 8 o'clock on the 1st of the month, and as a result of this choice of date, the word circulated among the frivolous that the mayor-elect was to address his fellow citizens adorned with a fool's cap. It was characteristic of the man that in order to gather together his ideas for this momentous oration, the first that it was his destiny to deliver to the general public since those early street corner harangues, he should make a private visit on the morning of April Fool's Day to the recesses of Wookie Hole. Potentially or not, Mr. Gerd said, paid his sixpence at the gate of Wookie Hole at such an early hour that the person who received it was not Will Zoyland, but Mr. Lamb, the landlord of the Zoyland Arms, an individual who, though he had heard of the new mayor of Gladstonbury, had never set eyes on him and had not, therefore, the least idea that he was admitting to his subterranean domain Philip's grand antagonist. Bloody Johnny had never, as it appeared, visited the cavernous shrine of the Witch of the Wookiee Hole since Philip had electrified the famous caves, and it was an exciting experience for him to wander down the illuminated pathway, watching the amazing metallic colors which these brilliant globes of light drew forth from the stalactites. He had the whole place to himself, a thing that Zoilan, when he was at the gate, always tried to avoid, being afraid of people losing themselves, and also afraid of the intrusion of tin mining agents from alien firms. But Mr. Lamb, naturally a very easygoing person, was not one to have his wits about him at nine in the morning. What he ought to have done was to make this early visitor sit down at the little shanty at the entrance and wait till more strangers arrived before turning on the lights. But Mr. Gerd got the full benefit, as he often did in the general drift of things, of this example of human negligence. He descended slowly between the rows of stalactites till he came to the level floor in the biggest of the caverns which ran that tributary of the subterranean river axe. Here he saw Philip's boat pulled up on the shelving back a sand and left exactly as it was when Persephone had stepped out of it. After a moment's hesitation, for he was no oarsman, Mr. Gerd entered this boat, and, with a good many blunderings and splashings, contrived at last to row himself up to the strip of shingle over which the formidable stone image of the Witch of Wookiee held her virtual immeasurable aeons. Here, Bloody Johnny awkwardly disembarked, feeling, though he knew nothing of Dante, very much what that medieval horror of hell felt when he, still a man of flesh and blood, moved among the infernal wraiths. He advanced under the precipitous wall of the vast cavern, his feet sinking as he walked, in the loose shingle of that aircronotic shore. Here he seated himself on a strip of dry sand and leaned his back against this wall of stone. He could not help wondering to himself 
what it would feel like if these electric lights were suddenly to be extinguished. <clears throat> Staring into the face of that stone image in the place lighted by the science of his enemy, Mr. Garrett found it easy enough to restore the wiki hole, the thick, long darkness into which it had fallen after the last human tribe deserted it. And it was out of the midst of this long darkness rather than in the new electric light that his nature now expanded. His large hands lay palms down and with the fingers spread out like two great white starfish on the shingle on both sides of him. No sign of life was there, no grass blade, no insect, no bird. He was alone with the metallic elements out of which an all organic entities are formed. Mr. Gurr was now good at concentrating thinking. He was not good at it. His deepest thoughts always came to him as the author of Foss declared his dead, crying like happy children, here we are. And the result of this was that a brief half an hour spent in composing a speech for that night exhausted him far more than the more protracted physical exertion would have done. He found himself caught in, as it were, pilloried in the re repetition of certain particular phrases. This happened to him every time he deserted his vague, rich, semi-erotic feelings and tried to condense his sheen to a rational statement. And it became really troublesome when, with his eyes tightly closed, he set himself to call up the audience of people and to imagine their responses to what he said. The thought of the audience and of the accursed appeal of reason seemed to throw a thin dust of impalpable sand over his whole life purpose. He continued to sit in the same position, with his fingers outstretched on the subterranean shingle, and his eyes closed. But the rational effort of his mind had begun to make brought about him all the unpleasant aspects of his normal life. A certain little piece of lead piping scrawled with a mark that always looked to him like a crocodile's shout, snout, and which he invariably caught sight of from the window of the water closet of the landing of Carter Villa, now presented itself before his closed eyes as he began to praise his speech. A certain star rod that had got hopelessly lo loose and that caused a peculiar rumpling of the stair carpet obtruded light itself before his vision. A certain indescribable familiarity which hung about the old doormat at Carter Villa and the scraper, as if these things had been placed at his gate by the evil one himself, especially to keep down the tempo of his mystical thoughts, came stealing over his mind. The painted metal cover of a certain matchbox which was kept on the dining room mantelpiece and with which always seemed to evoke the sterile adridity of hours of flat, spiritless repletion hove also in sight. Certain physical aspects of his wife and his elder daughter, certain tones of their voices, when they were least sympathetic to him, rushed pell-mell into his head. The gigantic phlegm of Mr. Geard and his massive, lumbering, lubbery passivity seemed to bring it about that these l trifles adhered thus viciously to his memory like bursts and prickles to the fur of some great drowsy beast. With what repulsive clearness, too, as he went on struggling to formulate his ideas, a certain glittering and yet curiously insipid light appeared before his fast shut eyes, the two o'clock and three o'clock light, falling on the galvanized iron roof of the unusual tool shed in the neglected garden. Teased to the top of his bent by what he had evoked in his dangerous gesture of damming up the sluices of his feelings by the machinery of reason, Bloody Johnny had recourse now to the grand human panacea for all mental abbreviations. He did what he ought to have done at once, before he started worrying his mind about the speech at all. He allowed his chin to sink down upon his burly chest and subside into a deep and dreamless sleep. Down upon the bowed head of Gerd of Latsonbury fell Philip's electric light. Beneath his feet rolled the swift, silent, metal-gleaming current of the water of Leith. Noon came upon those Summershire spring meadows above his sleeping place, with her cuckoo flowers and marsh marigolds, and gave place to an afternoon of rain-threatening cloud racks that gathered heavily upon the western horizon. But still Mr. Geard slept. Several times he changed his position without awakening, and at last his head and his shoulders actually slid down to the stag 
stalagmite base of the stone witch, and instinctively sought there a smooth concavity against which to lie at rest. Well, there you have it for tonight. Until next time, I'll see you in Gladstone. Cheers.